I'm Mark Boris and this is Straight Talk. I don't care at all who firebombed my house. I have no interest in that. I have no ill will towards them. But I fucking hate journalists. Hello, Australia. If you stripped away acting comedy, if you stripped away political commentary, at the end of the day, it's all performing. And I've always been fascinated with how do you get your idea into somebody else's head? We got Jordan Shanks over here versus mainstream media. They don't like you, you're an upstart. Savage political commentator. Controversial, friendly Geordies. I think that when I'm saying something, I'm saying it at the very least because I truly, genuinely believe that it'll be better for either the individual or society. Obviously, we've done some extremely dangerous reporting. I'm being sued by the Deputy Premier of New South Wales. There's risk associated with these views. I mean, that's pretty heavy getting your fucking house fire bombed. Do you have any idea who might have done it? I mean, look. Jordan Shanks, welcome to Straight Talk, mate. Thanks so much for coming in. No worries. Appreciate it a lot. Thanks for the invite. Is this a sort of... Do you do this much? No. I'm d- I don't like doing podcasts normally. Yeah? Well, I don't know. The, some, look, I, I, the reason I went on yours is because I watched a couple of your episodes and I thought, no, this is pretty decent. This is a good one. Which one did you, you, you listen to? You got one in mind? Which ones did I watch now? Because, like, there was... Flex? No, not Flex. <laughs> I can see you're no. a flex boy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously, I've and watched Rossiano. the Spaniard one. I watched the Will Anderson one. Yeah, yeah, Will's good. Um, and obvi- and what was the other one? Merrick Watts. Yeah, Merrick, yeah, he's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's actually interesting, those comedians, they're, they have a darker side to them. Not a darker side, but a complex side to them. Yes. You know, but they're not funny bastards all the time. No, they are, no. but they can be, but they're some of us performance-based, but they have a, a complexity associated with them. Mm. And I'm getting the same feeling from you. I mean, there's a complexity around Jordan Shanks, I think. And I'm actually, and, I, and if you don't mind, just go with it a little bit because I know you don't like doing podcasts, but just go a little bit. I just want to sort of dig it a little bit, if you don't mind. Mm-hmm. So I want to know... How how old are you? Which what's your age range? Where do you fit? Twenty to thirty? Yeah, that'd be my, my yeah. What's the, what's the demo breakdown? I'd be in the uh, twenty five to thirty five market. Right. So you're in, that's your market, okay? <laughs> and 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 your YouTube audience is that the same in the same category? Do you think you're feeding into that market? Is that who you are talking to? That and Zoomers. That's mostly that's that's the breakdown. Yeah. Yeah. So do do you target them because do you, well, do you target them or do you just or are they just following you? So no, they just talk because yeah, you know, it's just I, I really feel like a lot of the the, the the whole demo breakdown of oh you know you need to be hitting this person. I really feel like that those people are just going to naturally be attracted to you because they're similar to you. Yeah, yeah. So that's you, what. So you, I don't even think about. So they're it. following you as opposed to you chasing them, which is yeah, most yeah, important. yeah. They, they yeah. want to know what Jordan's got to say. Yes. So let me just go back a bit then. What's your deal? Like, you, know, you got a mum and dad? Like, I've always got a mum and dad, but you get they, <laughs> they together. Did you come from a, you know, or you just got brought up by a single mum? You, you know, like, we know about what, what's going on in your life, you know, because it's all over the various search engines about what's going on in life, <laughs> firebombed and all that sort of stuff. But, like, what about going back a bit? Like, you know what, actually? Uh, it, it really did strike a chord with me when I was listening to your podcast. I heard Will Anderson, I think he was talking about going to a Billy Conley show, if yeah. I'm correct. And he was watching Billy Conley on stage and he thought, I can do that. I had that exact thought watching Will Anderson. Really? Yes, that exact thought. As a, co- a comic? As, as a, com- a comic. As a comedian. I was watching an episode of The Glass House and something clicked in my head and I thought, I can do that. How long so ago? So that, that was really strange to me. Anyway, when I heard that, how long ago? That was when I was fifteen. Wow. Yeah. So I think anyway. I could yeah, have, yeah, yeah. But you know that f- range. Yeah, it was something like fifteen to sixteen. It doesn't matter. Something, yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter. But were you a student? Like you were a studious kid? Again, something clicked. I think in year eleven. Before that, I was just a dropkick that just played video games and you know just threw water bombs. <laughs> And, uh, and I think just uh, when when I hit like, yeah, I think it was year 11, something just clicked in my head and I thought like, damn, I'm like if I keep going down this trajectory, something bad is going to happen. So I started studying. 
And you picked up your game. I picked up my game. So where'd you go to school? In Sydney? Sydney boy? No, I'm, yeah, I'm a Sydney boy. I went to Newtown High. Newtown High, yeah. Mm. So you, you come from working class sort of folks. You weren't sort of sent to – you didn't go to Newington. Well, dude, not even working class. Lumpen proletariat, I reckon. Like my mum was on a disability pension. I lived with her most of the time. Uh, and then eventually, yeah, I suppose then I had a working class background because then I moved in with my dad and he was he was a builder, you know. So yeah, doing his yeah. best. Yeah. And so you, when did you, did you have aspiration to go to uni? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And did you? Yes, yes, I and did. What did you study? I studied politics. Politics and learned nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 university is <laughs> not supposed to teach you anything. It's supposed to teach you how to learn. Not ha- it doesn't actually teach you to learn anything. That's my view. Like university is about how do you learn things. Mm. I mean, what do you think mm. you got out of university education? Absolutely I mean, nothing until I went to Korea because you had to go overseas somewhere for a year. Well, like a so internship I went to type thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, like a just I don't know. It was it was like a it was international politics. So you had to go look at politics internationally. So you had to go somewhere for a year. I went to Korea because it was cheap. South Korea, I presume. South Korea, yeah. I mean, I wish, but it's kind of hard to get a visa. You might not have got back. (laughs) (laughs) So I went in there. I went in there, and uh, that guy, because it was Korea, and they didn't understand the English faculty at all. He moved from Canada because he realised that the way the politics was taught in university there was completely restrictive. And so he went to Korea where they didn't understand what he was teaching. Huh. And then I learned how politics works there. Did you end up as a chief of staff or a part of a staff of any political organisation here or did you end up in, in, in a, as a political correspondent or an aspiring political correspondent which is like at the top of the tree when it comes to newspapers? <laughs> did, you, did you end up doing any of those things? No, I wasn't interested. I mean, I was interested in politics but I wanted to get into comedy. So I went down that path and I, 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 kept, I kept abreast of politics, but I was never thinking, oh, I'm going to become a bureaucrat. That's my dream in life. Yeah, because, but, but you come across as pretty fucking articulate. Like uh, you're pretty smart. Oh, well, thank you. No, but yeah. I mean, that's the vibe I'm getting. <laughs> right. No, but you're, you're very much in control of your, what you say. Mm. You're quite purposeful, but composed. Uh, that's Jeez, the, that's a very nice compliment. No, but you are you're very composed. I mean, even when you're on a rant, I'm seeing some of you, some of your, there's some videos, but I don't know if they are coming out of it, one of your YouTube shows or what, but where you're having a crack at people, mm. particular in particular journalists, mm. and we'll talk about that one particular journalist in a moment. Common, common crack. <laughs> but but your 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 ability, and I don't know, I want to know where the hell this come from, but your ability to in a very composed way, be quite inflammatory and use inflammatory language. And I don't mean that in a shit way. I mean good inflammatory language. Mm. It's colourful. It's good. Mm. I liked it. Mm. Not a lot of people would, but I liked it. Not people in my category wouldn't like it. Older people don't like it, but I liked it. Mm. You didn't hold back, but at the same time you get you managed not to get muddled up. Where does that skill come from? That's a skill. Yeah, look, I think I was born with the gift of the gab. I think I always noticed that I have that ace in the hole. That was always the way of getting out of situations. That was a way of making light of some uh, situation to get out of like getting bashed. I was able to do that. I was able to just, you know, as you can clearly see, I can use it to bully. Like (laughs) like that's my tool. I, I like the written word. But it's so poised and well purposed. And word by word, it's it's quite efficient too. It's nearly like it's been written for when you're reading off a, a teleprompter to mm. me. That's what it looks like to me. Well, sometimes I do. No, but in the car, when you're sitting in the car and oh, you're, yes. you're just recording something on your phone, mm. uh, that's that's a hard thing to – you're only young. It's a hard thing to achieve. That That's not easy. I mean, I know actors who can't do that. Um, and I've been around doing this game for – you know, I'm pretty fucking old. And I, find, I would find it difficult, um, especially when I'm fired up. Mm. Are you able to quell the fire and make sure that the fire doesn't overtake the words and the, the message you're trying to give to whoever it is you're attacking, not attacking, but you're talking to? Now that you mention it, yes. I've never really thought about that before, but that is a combination of a few natural gifts that I 
had at a very young age. And I think I understood just like how basically every self-help book ever tells you. I think I naturally understood at a young age that you should be going down the path of your strengths. So it is a combination of the fact that I've read a lot of books about subjects that would be around that area. So state management, theater, comedy, writing, all of that. But I think that I was also born with it. So you actually study these methodologies. Oh yeah. That's what I did in university actually. Most of the time when I should have been studying politics, I was in the uh, library studying comedic theory or mostly actually comedic theory in uh, university. Because so I remember reading a stat that if you read 50 books in an area, you've got a PhD in it. So I did that. So comedic theory sounds to me like a way of controlling a crowd via your narrative. Oh, yeah, that's an element that's of it. Certainly sure. Nuremberg rally stuff, but I don't want to get into shit territory, but <laughs> I don't know, that could get a little bit sort of out of there. But, you know, but you know what I'm saying? Like uh, it's crowd control. Oh, yeah. You've got to bring the audience with you. Yes. And you've got to watch where they're going and where it's taking you to. It's easy when you've got an audience, actual physical audience. When you don't have an audience, you're just looking at a, a camera. It's a bit different, a bit harder. But do you think you know how to manage the audience to the outcome that you think is important? Yes, I think I can do that. And I think that that is a skill that takes years. And I think that Every year you can see that you get better at it. But you do realise after a while that comedy is, in fact, I would say that acting is as well. There's a con man element to it, you know, or like a yeah. carnival barker. There's, that that part, there's yeah. you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. There's Not a con real, man, but, but because that's. But the con men have that same ability, don't they? To yeah, kind of they, just change people's emotions shit, the way that, yes, they talk shit, yes. But it's that same thing of just like state emotion. You're supposed to feel this way. Another way of saying it, I suppose, is a magic act. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another way, a, a nicer way of putting it would so, be. So, you know, like a. I don't want to get, get, go down the stories, but like it's nearly like convincing people that the oil that you're going to sell them is going to make them live longer. It's, it's that ability. That's the ability you have. Do you get to a point where you feel as though, shit, hang on, am I being responsible in relation to the skill that I have? Do you ever get to that point where you challenge yourself? No, Evan, no, no because the thing is when I look at it, I realise that when I see a bunch of other people trying to get a message across, I just see people that have a lack of skill in the ability of getting the message off. And I think it is just because of that. I think everybody's heard it at this point, but the whole point of communication is 7% words. And the other 93% is body language and tonality. I think a lot of people just don't think about that. And it's like, if you want people to hear you out, you need to bring them along with you. So I just see it as, this is part of communication and I've always been fascinated with that. How do you get your idea into somebody else's head? And I think that I am always doing a lot of research on what I say before I say it. So I think that when I'm saying something, I'm saying it at the very least because I truly genuinely believe that it'll be better for either the individual or society because that's pretty much all I ever do these days now is pretty much, I mean, I still do comedy videos and I still do your nice little fun ones, but mostly it's either this is going to be something of benefit for society or I've got my self-help channel, which is this is going to be of benefit to you. And that's what I'm interested in. I'm not really interested in like, bamboozling people you know like it's it's not a motivator for me it's another skill you have and you probably don't even realize it but how important you think is the timber of your voice to the convincibility of what you got to say i'm aware of it i think that's it it's just i i think i know that how some people are gifted in mathematics some people are gifted in running i think that i'm gifted in performing i think that's the core of all of it I think that if you really stripped it away, if you stripped away acting, if you stripped away comedy, if you stripped away uh, political commentary, at the end of the day, it's all performing. It's all talking to an audience. As an I orator. think I'm good at that. As an orator. As an orator. Yeah, and, and I had I had one of, someone who I believe to be one of the best orators in the country, but, on his, but his content is very specific. That was Bob, Bob Carr. You're sitting there. Bob's oh, got, yeah. But wonderful voice. Oh, yeah, he's got a great voice. A wonderful timbre of his voice. Um, in fact, quite surprising when you hear it, when you mm. sort of sit with him. And his content 
doesn't always suit everybody, but but he's quite engaging because you sort of get mesmerized by his voice, mm. and uh, he has a a great body language too, different to yours, but a great body language. Mm. And for those, and a lot of people listen to these sorts of podcasts and they're trying to learn something from it, you know. So, I mean, what I try to do is, what I'm trying to do here is sort of get pointers for people. Um, voice is important. What do you mean by body language? You when it comes to head. body language, look, I don't really, because most of it's all just this. Yeah, but I can it's see very, your hands, but I can huh? see your face. I can see your eyes. Yes, yes, that's what, yes, just that though. But I, in terms of my actual body, that's something that I've never developed. I think that I have a very goblin-y, crotchety way of naturally sitting it's it's terrible and i should go and develop that that's always been something in the back of my head but in terms of facial expressions uh i've read a lot of books on facial expressions and i think that that's just something that you need to be very acquainted with again i think that if you if you are trying to get a message across to somebody else i mean look there's an old saying in radio that if you aren't smiling when you're talking, don't be on air. This, yeah. the, these basic things I think people just don't understand. But then obviously there's points where you don't want to be smiley and happy and jokey. And so you have to change your facial expression. I don't know. It's just like the, these are things that I think people, because they aren't trying to perform, they're just going through day-to-day -day life and they're feeling their emotions as they come. They don't think about those things. They're tactical. And I kind of, yes, it's tactical. I kind of do envy them in a way because I think that when you do get to the stage where you are just a professional performer, like every part of your emotions and faces are always very too conscious. Everything's a bit manufactured. I think that's what happens after a while. But, you know, that's the price of the beers. It's like everything else. This camera that's on you at the moment is sort of only going from, the, from sort of your chest up sort of thing, right? And so seeing your hands, seeing your face... But if the camera could show your whole body, I see two parts. Yeah. <laughs> and I see, I, I see Jordan, <laughs> the performer at the top, yeah. the voice, yeah. the face, the eyes, the hands. Yeah. But below, if the camera could just I can shoot down there, which it's not going to do because it's fixed on the thing. But Jordan's sitting there very legs crossed away from me in terms of body language, but away from me, really guarded to some extent. And I, my, my, my gut feeling is you are – Open but guarded at the same time, and uh, and you you know how good you can control shit. And uh, by the way, I've had a few comedians in here, mm. and some try to interview me. They try to turn around on me. Mm. They they well, Mark, what do you think about this? Mm. Which you haven't done, which is great. Thank you, appreciate it, because mm. my fucking podcast. Um, but 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 you you're that's the way they control the situation. You control the situation by controlling yourself. You're only going to give me exactly what you fucking want to give me, which I'm cool with. I'm happy with it because that's why I, I love talking to people and finding out how they operate, how they flow, how they mm. roll. And mm. it's really I'm really curious about how someone like you operates. Mm. Halfway down. I'm not going to give you fucking anything, Mark, that I don't want to give you. <laughs> above me, above where I can see and where the camera's on, total pro, dude. Uh, uh, I'm serious. I'm a finger puppet. It, fucking hell, it's going up and down. Like I just wish this camera could fucking pan down. But but and and that's a skill because I mean I do it to myself when I with my myself when I get on and say if I'm on say whatever morning show or something, I do it myself because my game is like a politician. I don't give a fuck what you ask me. I'm going to give you the answer I'm there to talk about. And it's a way to do it. Yeah. And you've become very good at that mm. because it goes back then to your belief system mm. in relation to what you said earlier, which I parked. This is what's important for society. What you believe is important for society mm -hmm. is what you're going to talk about and mm -hmm. what you're going to plant in my brain if mm -hmm. I listen to you or what, mm -hmm. at least you're going to attempt to do that. Mm -hmm. And obviously you're being very successful because there's a, you've got a big following, massive following. So what's really kicking you up the ass at the moment that you feel compelled to talk about? And how do you come to those beliefs, those views? The general way that I would put it actually also came from university when I wasn't studying was this is something I talk about all the time on self-help. I walked past a Tony Robbins book. Uh, you know, it was very poor. Uh I was like, as everyone else, he's a snake oil salesman. I picked it up. I started reading it. I was like, oh, my God, this is life-changing. Because when you come from a poor background, 
you, you kind of just accept that you're just going to live in squalor for the rest of your life, you know. And so anyway, I started reading. I was like, holy shit, like successful people think completely differently to how I think. I started changing that. So you read a Tony, a Tony Robbins book? Yeah, when wow. I was 19. And wow. if I didn't walk past that book in the library, I can't imagine being here today. That completely changed my life. Uh, I think ever since then there has been a combination of two things, which is that I came from a poor background. Uh, I understand how important the social welfare system is. I probably wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't. Uh, but I also have that other understanding as well of like, you know, personal responsibility and improvement. I think that my personal ideology is a combination of both of those things. And I am a big fan of pragmatism and incremental improvement. Of yourself or of society? Of both. Both. Of both. So what does incremental improvement of yourself mean? Do you mean in your skills or just getting a bit of fucking house? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what are we talking about here? <laughs> Mostly I'm just talking about skills. Yeah, yeah. When I'm good. talking about it, I'm always just like I, – I, 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 Improving. Exactly. Getting better. Like I getting really better. feel like if you didn't improve at all in a day, it was a wasted day, that's a real goal on you yourself. The, the you know, seven habits of highly effective people thing of just exercise, read, meditate every day. I live by that. Um, and I think that it comes doubly so when it comes to society. And it really does strange me out when I hear people say things like, I can't believe Anthony Albanese hasn't done anything. It's like, well, how long do you think it takes to change a nation's direction? What, you think it? you just walk in there one day, point your fingers around, the king so saith, you think this is how politics works? It's, it's really, <laughs> you mean no, the naivety? The naivety people uh, sh shocks you. The naivety of people really shocks me, but it also really shocks me that if you try and sell people the idea uh, that your life can be radically different in ten years if you start making small changes every day, people will be excited and engaged by that idea. When you talk about that on a societal level, and it really like. It's way slower than that on a societal level because you're talking about directing, what, 25, 30 million people in a direction? It's way slower than that. But people, as soon as you tell them that, get disengaged and say, this is not for me and, what, you know, why isn't it happening now? Why isn't my life completely different? You know, like there's a, there's a real disconnect there when it comes to society. And I think that that's actually something that really animates me now is just kind of telling people, this is the way that things work. <laughs> I think that most people just don't understand that, which is understandable. Like, I don't know how your work works at all, but it is important to understand how government works because that's something that affects us all. That's something that animates me. Then when it comes to government, because you, know, you study this stuff, I mean, it's your, it's your, it's your bent, politics, mm. governing. We shouldn't be surprised. Governing is about controlling outcomes it's managing all of us that's what government does governments do so you know, i get the shit sometimes with their decisions but at the end of the day they're there to do their job based on their politics and that's what governments do like covid gave me the shits because uh i kept getting fed a whole lot of stuff about covid i didn't like it um i i didn't like I, i'm not saying i didn't believe it was a pandemic i'm not saying any of that sort of stuff one way or the other but i just didn't like being told how i had to think but at the end of the day, I had to come to terms with the fact that that's what governments do. That's why they're there. They're there to govern. And governing is controlling the way things are based on what they believe is going to be the outcome, even though their belief system, in my opinion, was based on wrong data and wrong wrong calculations and wrong modelling is probably the best thing. That was what was killing me is the modelling was fucking wrong. And by definition, when someone says the science says and the modelling says, I know models are generally speaking always wrong. Because mm. you can't put every single input into the model, especially at the beginning. You can over time, mm. but you can't at the beginning. So mm. that was what was killing me. Mm. So given that, do you get frustrated with the very concept of, of the way politics works and government works? Because gov to me, governing in the modern world is totally inefficient. Just, just, just doesn't seem to work for me. I'm not suggesting anarchy, but what do you think about that? 
you know, that, that whole process of governing. How Albanese right now is not actually bringing in, I've not seen any real policy come out of him yet. Maybe he's hoping for a second term, no policy this term, don't do anything that's going to get me unelected or knocked out, get re-elected, bring my policies in in the second term. Do you? Well, that was his platform. Yeah. His platform was I'm not going to do anything. Well, t- t- see, this is the whole thing. When people say he's not doing anything, I think what they want is they want the big PR yeah, announcement. Totally. That, yeah, totally. You know, yeah, like, yeah. But really what's but he's happening doing PR is he's rebuilding. So. Yes, he's doing PR. Well, obvious. But what he's really doing is rebuilding all of these broken down public services that have just been completely ransacked by the Liberals for the last 10 years. And that takes time. That is a huge accomplishment in itself. Like to just get, uh, you know, Medicare working properly again after it's just been gutted and like a thousand elements have been privatised, uh, to start rebuilding environmental reform. That takes time. To start trying to make uh, full employment and instead of like this part-time employment economy. Th- these are things that like, they're reforms. It's not really like a big policy announcement. These are things that are behind the scenes where you have to like rebuild the entire bureaucracy from top down. That's that's a big challenge in itself. So I Massive. think that the, exactly right. So it's it's. I think that the thing is when people talk about this stuff, it's like, look, the institutions that we have now, they've been around since Roman times. They work. It's just a matter of having somebody in there that wants them to work. I think that that's the real challenge of keeping people like that in government, especially when it's very very easy for special interests to come in. Uh, and like, you know, start a campaign on one small, tiny issue, make the nation focus on that tiny issue and then get a government that is like broadly managing many things out. I mean, I immediately went to the, yeah, the, to, to the, uh, the voice campaign. Um, do you think that the, this government is trying to give us that, that issue over here whilst at the same time they're, uh, like pedaling underwater or paddling underwater over the word is like like going crazy underwater trying to fix all the other things that are broken. Do you think that's where we're at at the moment? They're trying to distract us over here by trying to fix a whole lot of other stuff like unemployment. Well, I don't think that the government really thinks about this. That's a real media thing. Like the media really decides what to focus on. I mean, the voice is just one element. I suppose it's a referendum, so it's like a bigger yeah, yeah. issue than normal. But really, like... How often do you think Anthony Albanese thinks about The Voice on a day-to-day basis? Probably the two minutes that someone at Sky News is just like, what do you think about polling? And like, the other, like yeah, maybe he's the Prime Minister. He's thinking yeah, yeah, about yeah. a lot of different things. <laughs> you know, yeah. like it's a big, big job. There. Yeah, well, it's a 24-hour job too. It doesn't stop. Yeah. I think that that's another thing that I've just started to get an appreciation with over the years. It's like, yes, there are... I, I really don't like the generalizations of the world. It's the same thing. Like I'm sure that you get it all the time in your field of work, right? It's just like what we were just talking about with the big short beforehand. It's like, oh, if they're on Wall Street, they're evil. Yeah. Maybe not, dude. Maybe, maybe some people on Wall Street have donated $500 million to charity. They're evil. What, the, you know, they're, they're, they're a bad guy. You know, like the, 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 I, I think that just like these broad generalizations of people just with the, oh, you know, oh, po- politicians are hopeless. They're all bastards and stuff. It's, I know from experience and I know from studying these people, these are very intelligent people that have devoted their entire lives usually to trying just pushing shit up a hill and then going, and then that's the end of their life. And that's all they can do. But they did it and the li- and life is a lot better for everybody and they'll never be thanked for it. I think that this is just a whole thing that you get in government all the time. Is There's a, there's a saying in it that, you know, you, if you gave everyone a bike, they'd complain about the colour. Yeah, I think- <laughs> that's 100% right. By the way, it's true. I've experienced that, not where I complain, where I've done those things. And I've actually had people complain about stuff I give to them. Like, what, what, what do you mean? Like I, I, many years ago, um, I gave, I bought a house for this woman. Um, no who, way. Yeah. That's who a lovely had, gesture. Who needed a triple bypass. So she, Amazing. Like a, no, triple transplant. I can't remember what it was, liver, kidney, heart or something. I don't know what it was. Anyway, I paid for the house and then... Channel 9 come and renovated it for her and they obviously tried to do a bit of leverage out of it. That's fine. Leverage their brand. It was a TV show sort of around it and, you know, all that stuff. She passed away, unfortunately. She she didn't wasn't able to get the things that she needed. And then her husband contacted me because he was she was married. Obviously, he's got the house and he come and saw me. And he asked me to – I just thought I'd better see the dude. And uh, 
out of courtesy and uh, he complained about the fact that when I bought the house, there was an old air conditioning system in it before Channel 9 renovated and they pulled the old air conditioning system out and put a new one in and he asked me where the old air conditioning system was because it was valuable and what happened to it. No, no. <laughs> and, uh, and then he complained that one of the, the dryer that was put on the laundry wall or something had come loose. By the way, he didn't pay for anything. Um, and that could I arrange for someone to come and um, put it back on the wall. Mm. Like for a start, I bought it for his wife. I didn't buy it for him. Yes. Like uh, and and so that's, that's that's sort of a big example of where someone people don't people will complain about the color of the bike if everyone got a bike. And I, and I get it. Um, but but your but politics is about a whole heap of whinges, no matter who's in politics, liberal, labor, nationals. I don't give a shit. Greens. And over here we got the politicians who some of whom are you know, dedicating their lives to what they're doing, whether it doesn't matter what side of politics they're from, only able to do things in short bursts, but actually trying their very best to get the outcomes. Then you've got the media sitting up here, particularly the mainstream media, who decide what they're going to write based on what they want to sell and how many, how many uh, copies they want to sell or how many clicks they want to get on it. Mainstream media, it seems to me anyway, that... We got Jordan Shanks over here versus mainstream media. It looks like you position yourself to to me to be the auditor of what mainstream media tell us about how politics is working for all of us, the punters. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? It is. You feel an obligation around that? Absolutely. That is a huge obligation of mine that I feel a lot of, I don't know why, I feel a lot of responsibility about it and I think it is because this was, it was it just, yeah, look, I go down these paths. Sometimes I just get obsessed with the subject and I start reading a lot about it and I read a lot of academic papers about media bias. I did a show about it and I think that, but I think that that's the whole thing. Like there's a couple of insights that I really gleaned from it that I think are very useful for the rest of everybody else to see. This is the first one is just a really broad conspiratorial thing, but it's just the more I look at it, the more it's true, which is that it is just a giant hypnosis machine. That's the first one. That's just, you, it's, it's, I can't, like the more you look into it, the more you just realise that that's the case. And the other one is uh, that when people think of bias, they think of ideological bias. This one's left wing, this one's right wing. I hate those words in themselves. I find those words just part of the hypnosis in that it's just a way of dividing people and making them kind of believe like a bunch of ideologies because they're that person. Yeah, that's your, that's your gang. That's your gang. Yeah. That's your gang. Uh, so. Or well, that's not my gang. Or well, that's not my gang. That's, yeah. that's the more important one yeah, yeah. actually. Fuck you. Yeah. That, you're yes. right. Uh, yeah. yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly yeah. it. Yeah. I like the massive hypnosis, hypnosis uh, scenario. That's just pretty cool. But so, where where do you where do you fit them? Where does what's Jordan trying to do? Are you trying to write that, or are you just trying to balance it? No, I'm trying to balance it out. I'm basically saying that uh, I look when when you look at uh, media bias, you shouldn't be looking at the ideology. The ideology is a sideshow. That's a distraction. That's what you were actually saying. What you were saying there about politics, that's exactly what I think about the media. I think that it's just like, they're just like, hey, everybody look at the voice or something like that or whatever it is, yeah? Uh, really, when you're looking at media bias, you should be looking at agenda. You should be looking at what are they getting you to focus on and why are they getting you to focus on it? And it's not ideological. It's usually a business decision. In the ABC's case, it's a government decision. It weirds me out to this very day that people think that the ABC is this independent, free-thinking, publicly funded institution. It's like, do you think the guy at the train station announcing when the train is coming is doing it because he wants to? That's his job. He's paid by the government to say that. That's all they are, glorified train announcers. Sorry. Anyway. I see myself. <laughs> that'll, that'll get a run. <laughs> I see myself. I see myself pretty much as a uh, voice for the worker. That's what I try and see myself as. Because if you look at it, these institutions are owned by 
massive businesses or they're owned by the government. Uh, where's the person just talking about? And I'm not, that's, that's, if you're talking about identity politics, that's who I'm aiming at. Well, when you say who I am by the government, like you're talking about, well, that, that's not like, it's not Anthony Albanese, but who, who's the government? Like, is it somebody, senior person who's in charge of media in the public service, the unelected officials? Are we talk, who are we talking about here? When it comes to the ABC, well, the ABC example, has gone through, huh? For example, just as an example. The ABC has gone through 30 years of rot. Uh, this was a deliberate tactic from John Howard. There's a really good book on this, uh, which name escapes me now. I think it was called Who's Who Owns the ABC, maybe. But I think that might have been it. But pretty much he came in and he had the idea that the ABC is pro the Labor Party, which probably it was after, you know, 11 years of Hawke and Keating or whatever, but obviously it would be because that's what it does. It just reflects the government of the day. However, because the Liberal Party has been in for so long consecutively, uh, they have stacked the board entirely. Uh, if you look at it, it is just filled with card-carrying Liberals at the board because, like, who cares what the journalist says? It's like it's saying, a, you know, a, a vegan at a steak restaurant is saying, I, I want you to have the vegan. They're going to sell you the steak. That's their job, you know? Like, that's what the journalist <laughs> yeah. is doing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but that, the board is where it matters. And if you look at the board, it's all card-carrying Liberals. It, depending on the fact if the Labor Party stays in for so long, it'll probably get stacked with the Labor Party. But you should know that one element of it, that it is trying to set you the agenda of the day. It knows that it has to play board now that the ball now that there is a Labor government in, but because this is a new Labor government, it's going to take years for those contracts to expire. So it is still heavily weighted to the Liberal Party as of now. And I will tell people when the board has been restacked. It's funny you should say that because it's, it's like the Reserve Bank, a bit more in my territory, but like the Reserve Bank board are all appointees of the Liberal Party. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Labor Party, as soon as they got elected, had a review of the Reserve Bank. Mm -hmm. And now they've decided to have two boards of the Reserve Bank. Mm -hmm. One doing the day-to-day -day stuff and the other one doing the interest rate decisions. Mm. And they're going to make the appointments. Mm. It's up to Jim Chalmers. He's going to make, mm -hmm. the, make the call and it'll mm -hmm. be Labor people. Mm -hmm. It's the same, same consequence we talk about in America about the Supreme Court, you know, the ultimate appeal, appellate court in the US. But let's make sure, and Trump talks about it. I've got, no, I think, seven out of 13 judges or something are appointed by the Conservatives or, 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 or by Trump and his team. Therefore, I control the political outcome because whatever the laws are, they've got to be interpreted by court. And this shit exists across the board in every in every political environment. I take your point. But you see your job is to bring that to the to the public's attention. Because we forget about that shit. We forget about it all the time. All the time. Well it's not the human brain's conditioned, isn't it? Well we we, we don't think. Well we, yeah the, just we just eat, you know, like we consume. We're just taking it in. We, we forget yes. to critically think or interrogate is probably a better word. Well, I think it's even more basic than that. It's kind of just like when you put a ball in front of a dog's face and then it really wants the ball. I think that that's it. It's just like Can't you, take his as eyes soon as you ball. put something on someone's, in front of someone's eyes and just be like, pay attention to this, people pay attention to it. But is that, it's is like that, a really simple trick. Huh? But it's, it's like a massive form of crowd control manipulation or whatever. Like yes, that. massively. And it is but exactly. It's like the, if you go back to magic tricks, that is all of it, right? Like it is just the art of like distraction. It's mostly just look at this hand while this hand's doing something else. So does that's did, how I see the press. So, John, do you think? But do you really? Is it? Is it true that there's something wrong with that though? I mean, absolutely. It, yeah, absolutely. Or does it mean? Or does it depend on if I am doing that? You know, distraction game, but I'm really have a good intention to really look after the majority of the, the people who are watching me to help them improve their lives or improve society. Do you think the, the technique or the mechanism matters? Oh, in that sense, yes. But the thing is, look, if you look at who runs media companies in this country, they do have very nefarious agendas. If you're saying that maybe there's like a, a, a virtuous person out there that might one day control the reins of these production, yes, that, that's theoretically possible, yes. But usually these are businesses trying to make money and you can go through the entire history. I highly recommend that people read this book called Paper Emperors and the... Uh, Paper so, Emperors. Paper Emperors and Media Moguls. And it just goes through the last hundred years of this country, which is just... This is the repeated pattern of the press in this country. Uh, 
the reason the papers were set up in this country really was union busting. It was just to smash unions. Anytime a union was set up, say, in Broken Hill, the Broken Hill Times would come up and then it just put anti-union propaganda out all the time. That's how they were formed in this country because they understand that it is not beneficial to them to have a party in power that is representing workers. They want that in and you can see it when... If Look, by any metric whatsoever with the Liberal Party, right, it doesn't matter what your ideology is. Like if you're just looking at the metrics of how they governed, if you're looking at economic performance, we're at the top of the OECD under the Labor Party, we're at the bottom of the OECD under the Liberals. If they really cared, if they were just saying like, look, I get the argument of uh, economic management, we're, we're there for economic management, you're not delivering. You were not delivering for 10 years and the Labor Party was. So what argument are we having here? But they kept siding with them for 10 years. Every election, supporting them, every election, just pushing the, whatever the narrative was at the time. So like with Scott Morrison's, it was all just about, oh, my God, Frank and Credit's nightmare. Like, you know, that that should have been the focal point of an election, like this weird little accounting trick that affected, what, 0.6% of the population or something. But that was a huge part of of an election. It is bizarre to think about now. Is, do you think that, that is was, so strange. Or do you think it's clever politics? Huh? Or do you think it's clever politics by... Well, it's clever... The, 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 when you're talking about these institutions, the they all work with each other and they talk to each other, obviously. And Scott Morrison, you know, he got exposed just having like this big dinner party with all the journalists and whining and dining them. And So, yes, it's a narrative that they build together. But, you know, you cannot say that the media is not biased towards the Liberal Party when... They, uh, Channel 9 had like a, a fundraiser for them at their headquarters, you know? You, like, I mean, you, you would have to be brain dead to not think that the, the, the Murdoch press supports the Liberal Party. When it comes to the ABC, it's just like, dude, that's their boss. That was their boss for 10 years. Like, you, you know what I'm saying? You get more people download your YouTube videos than any TV show. Now I do. This yeah. was the first year. Yeah, but you, but you do. Like, so you would outrate... Every TV show. Individually. Yeah, well, yeah, not, no, no, not, individual. not all of them, not all of them. But oh, maybe Maths might beat you or something like that. Yeah, it's one yeah, of those yeah, stupid yeah. fucking <laughs> things. But, but, like, but, 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 but you would, but you would. And, and do you think, though, you're, you're doing the same thing, though, but in a different, with a different outcome or a different objective? Do you think that you are using all your God-given skills and charms and and your accumulated knowledge from your extensive reading and being studious, a student of all these things that you're talking about, do you think you are doing something similar but from a different point of view? That, you know, your technique is the same as them. Yes, but I think that, you know, the, the Murdoch press pushed for the Liberal Party because they wanted, uh, you know, no NBN in this country so that he could get another 10 years out of just having a monopoly on the cables. <laughs> and so he could just keep running Foxtel into the ground for another 10 years. So he added a government for that. I'm not making my decisions on multi-billion dollar business decisions that benefit me personally. Right. So you, you're, you're, so when, okay, so now how do you build a belief? So the belief system is not about how many you don't own anything outside of your show. It's not as if you own a newspaper or whatever. Like you're trying, you're not trying to protect anything. Like Murdoch might be trying to protect, for example. Yes. So, when you build your belief systems as what is better for society, how do you work out whether, in the example of NBN, for example, what's better for us? I mean, how do how, do you consult with people? Do you how do you work it out? How, how do you work that fucking shit out? Like it's a uh, it's pretty they they're big issues. Yeah. Important issues, but big issues too. Comp complex. Yes. How, how do you how do you sort of make a deduction at the end of the day? Or do you well, just, just the same way that everyone does, right? Like you read and talk to experts, but that's just all I do. Every oh, well, day no, I process. don't have a life. I sit there and read and I talk to experts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so that's your game. So, you, th so that's your point. So you do actually cons you are consulting with people yes. on the topic. Yeah. And then you go to town. Mm. You basically get into your show and you 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 produce it to have an outcome. Mm. And do you ever have points where you think, fuck, I went too far or uh, I shouldn't have said that or maybe should I, I, I got to change my, my call on that particular item or that particular concept? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I have them all the time. And what do you do? And I think that that's, that is 
it, nothing angers me more than when you're talking to someone and you know that you may as well be talking to an answering machine, that there is no openness to their mind at all. And I understand that every human being has like an inherent bias where they just think I'm immediately right, you know? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. they've got all of those things happening uh, in their how head. How you grow up should... and stuff like that. Hmm? How you grow up and stuff like your parents and all that. Were you in a school Absolutely. Shit? Yes. Yeah. But I think that you should be trying to fight that. Now, I'm not saying that I'm perfect when it comes to I am this arbiter of whatever knowledge comes my way. I just make evidence-based decisions. I think that even that, even just believing that in itself proves that you're not. Uh, but I try. <laughs> yeah, so you don't mind doing I it. I try. Yeah, but so you I try to change my mind, you know. like I like it when I'm wrong. You don't mind changing as you go along? No, I mean... One that I just had recently is just I've been working on it for the last three weeks. Sorry, it's why I'm extremely tired right now. It's just been staying up late because I'm trying to get out this very long video just showing what a marketing pyramid scheme the Greens are. But when I was 18, I thought that they were amazing for the environment. Why? Because they said they were. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, can you? Do, now do, I don't think that. Well, I mean, I don't <laughs> want to do breaking news, but like, can, can you explain it a little bit more? Do you mind? Can you just share a little bit about that? Yeah. Okay. Look, this is a classic strategy of theirs. Uh, with the housing bill at the moment, right? That yep. they're just yep. holding up in part. the big debate in town Senate. Yeah. yeah. It's like, but they made it that. Yeah. And and why? Because it, they know that every time that because look. Lydia Thorpe really shouldn't have left that party. She is exactly a microcosm of what that is, which is what Paul Keating describes them as a bunch of opportunists and trots, which is really what they are. It's just it's just a bunch of crazy people and people that realise, oh, it's easy to get a seat this way in this really cynical coalition. And they basically do what Lydia Thorpe does, but Lydia Thorpe is just crackhead levels of insane, like just getting kicked out of strip clubs and everything. But that's basically the Greens modus operandi. I mean, think about this, for instance. This is supposedly a party that cares about the environment, always talking about climate change to the point that, you know, if you did care about the environment, I can't remember the last time they talked about plastics or uh, you know, deforestation or water protection. I can't remember. It's always about climate change, right? If that's the case, why did they block Kevin Rudd's carbon emissions trading scheme? You know, th that was, you would understand this as a businessman, right? Like the, just the, the sheer arrogance to say, let's not bring the private sector along with this like huge task. Like what, what is the private sector? 85% of the population? Yeah. Let's not bring them along. Let's make it all bureaucrats in transforming the energy grid, transforming industry, all these necessary steps that are massive. Let's not do any of that. That's really what you're saying by not, you know, having like an emissions trading scheme of, you know, trading emissions yep. with, big, you know, you, you, you yeah. get the basic gifts of it, right? That was their ideological point. How dare you do that? This should just be a government top-down thing. Okay, yeah, but... Maybe that might be more efficient, whatever. But the point is it's not the real world. It's it's fantasy stuff. They would have known that. They would have known that. But they also would have known because the, the Greens cannot exist without saying, you know, we're making Labor better. The Labor Party is just this terrible, shitty party. Uh, you know, the Liberals are awful. Both major parties are terrible. And we can, you know, attach ourselves like a sucker fish to the Labor Party and then control, you know, uh, 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 these Balmain wine mums and Byron Bay hippies <laughs> can like, you know, <laughs> just just they they know what's better for workers than the working party, you know, like yeah. they, they're going to get their little go on it. And so then they get in there. Uh and, you know, they, they deliberately obstruct something that they know would be an active work, uh, an, an active price on carbon. They know that, that that's like the only workable alternative and yet they sink it because they know that they can cause a huge media scene and by causing a huge media scene, they get the idea in people's heads that the Labor Party sucks and then they get to suck some of the vote off of the Labor Party. They did it with... Uh, uh, the Malaysia solution, and now they're doing it with housing. This is the modus operandi of how they operate. Because it seems to me, when I look at what one of their one of their conditions on mm -hmm. the passing the bill, 
Through the Senate, it is about putting a cap on rents, um, which, by the way, is a state government thing as opposed to a federal government thing. But anyway, yep. um, it looks yep. like an impossibility. I don't yeah. see how Labor can ever agree to it. Yep. I mean, just it'll sink them. You know, it'll be the, that'll be the uh, franking credits for the next election. That'll be the Easily. negative gearing for the Absolutely. next election. Yep. Um, Labor won't do it. Yeah. So therefore, it can't get through. Yeah. And on top of that, but it's a good it's bill. It's a terrible economic decision as well. Like I've I've gone through it. Every single this is insane. Every single example they give, it's always like, oh, San Francisco did it. You look at it, what happened? Landlords just went, I'm not making any money. They sold their properties. The rental market shrank. Oh, you know, uh, New Jersey did it. The rental market shrank. Spain did it. The rental market shrank so much that they just abolished it last week. But they're still using Spain as this example that you should be – because it's not about that. It's just about selling elixirs to people. This is something that I always think about minor parties, right? I have my differences with the Liberal Party, but they understand – actually not really under Scott Morrison's reign, but you, I'll give it to Tony Abbott and John Howard. They had respect for the parliamentary procedure. They had respect for how government runs. Minor parties do not. Most minor parties are just elixir salesmen selling a particular brand of narcissism to a small section of society and that's how they get in. And so it's never like, you know what I mean? Like Clive Palmer just saying, I'm going to freeze mortgage rates by 3%. It's like, well, I mean, I yeah, you can do that, well, Clive. I'm yeah. not going to freeze it for you, Clive. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. If, you, if you think me, I'm going to eat my 220000 I'm going to freeze my mortgage. I can't because it will go broke. We won't, won't, won't exist after uh, six months. Yeah. Because if the interest rate goes up and I'm freezing at three percent or whatever he was talking, he was talking about three three percent. Money costs today four and a half percent. Is it insane? Money costs me insane? four yeah. and a half. So you'd be saying the this whole was... the whole banking system would have collapsed. Exactly, exactly. But that's the economic problem. You know what the other problem is? He can't. He doesn't have that power. Yeah. But he gets to put it on billboards, and it's fine. No one says anything. And it's exactly the same with the Greens. Free national freeze of rents. And it's just like you see all the kiddies now just being like, yeah, freeze rents. It's like you were the same ones being snarky about Clive Palmer saying freeze mortgage rates at 3%. But then when the Greens say freeze rent, all of a sudden it affects you. You like the green tonic. You know? How do you fix that though? I mean, how, I mean, not how do you fix it? Yeah, how do you fix it? How, apart from commentary, like is your game to bring awareness to the – uh, the idiocracy of this stuff, you know, like, and also, by the way, drawing those people who are voting for the Greens because they think we have need a better environment, they're a climate change sort of advocates, how do you bring them to say, look, what you're voting for is exactly what Clive Palmer's doing over here, but it's, it's just a different, slightly different agenda. Do you, is that your game to bring that to everyone's attention, especially your cohort of listeners? Oh, yeah. Well, that's what I've realised is I can't convince Clive Palmer voters. I can't no. convince One Nation voters. They're too old. Like, they don't yeah, watch yeah, me. Yeah. They don't use the internet. Yeah. <laughs> Zoomers do. What I do like about Zoomers, there's a lot of things that I don't like about that generation, but one thing that I do like about them a lot is because they grew up with the internet. They check their sources. They grew up in a world where it's just like, oh, I'm lost for a second. Oh, no, I'm not. I looked at my phone. You know, like they they know that they can just Google anything at any time. And so apparently, this is what all the research is coming out, Zoomers are the most malleable in their mindset. Now, I don't mean malleable as in twisting it, but as in like exactly, they'll change their mind. Yeah, they're prepared. If they hear a good argument, yeah. they'll change their yeah, mind. Yeah, yeah, totally. That's great. And, and by a mile out of any generation, that is the generation that does it. And it is because they're the Google generation. And so I think that if I make a strong enough argument about the fact that, you know, look, really, I've been thinking about this a lot recently. The Greens, and they target exactly the same people, Triple J listeners. It's all that brand image of like, oh, we're underground and edgy because we're listening to music that like sells out stadiums but not stadiums multiple nights in a row. And it's just like really what you're doing is you're selling the brand of counterculture to people who can't be bothered to find underground music themselves. That's what you're doing. And that's the Greens. It's just like, do you think you're a good person? Here's the Greens. They're making Labor better. It's, 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 a, it's a marketing con. And I think that once you explain the facts and figures, I honestly think that Gen Z will be like, yeah, there's a reason that the Labor Party has survived for 100 years. That, that's it's a pretty, vital institution. So, that, no, that's no, that, that's pretty strong talk, you know. Though it is. That's, sorry, yeah. that's good. No, but it's good. No, no, it's good. But did, but it, but you know. But at the end of the day, like I mean, I, I read somewhere like him, and I saw I saw Paul Barry fucking carrying on about it. Like you got your house firebombed. Like there's risk associated with these views. I mean, 
that's pretty heavy getting your fucking house firebombed. Can you, can, do you mind if I ask you, were you at home? Or did, nah. You went home and happened? Well, I was too stupid to be home. I forgot my keys. That's why I'm alive. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I left them in Melbourne. Serious? Yeah, that's why, that's why I wasn't home. And, and do you have any idea who might have done it? Do you get a warning? Do they put a little fucking ticket under your no, door? No, but and say that's it? the whole thing because they don't understand. We piss too many people off. You have to be more explicit than a firebombing. Yeah. Send me a note. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but at least I'm up to card, it. A call card, something. At least I'm up to it. Yeah. <laughs> or, 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 or put a, a sort of a pseudonym down there, like something that you know, even give yourself a name but that doesn't exist as a fake name, fake it or something, for fuck's sake. I mean, I, I was dying to know because, like, so, when you got – I mean, firebomb is pretty heavy, to be honest with you. I know you're laughing at it, but it is a pretty heavy thing. Um, was there much damage? Like, or was it just a little fire at the front of the door? Like, I mean, I just saw a, a flame on, you know, on, on, on telly. But what was the extent of the – was it an actual bomb? Like a Molotov cocktail or something like that? Well, see, here's the thing. They don't even know. They think it was, but they're still doing lab tests. But it's obviously some kind of petrol or something. But the thing is uh, it burnt, I think, everything except the back room in the kitchen of my house. Wow. So it was all unusable and riddled with asbestos. Um, well, I don't go there anymore. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> but like, so how do you feel? I mean, do you feel? Do you ever feel under threat? Like do you, do you ever sort of look over your shoulder and think, fuck me, I wonder if I really piss someone off, I'm going to cop it across the back of the net head or something. Do you ever feel that or that doesn't bother you? No. Why not? A firebomb is pretty heavy. That's the sort of shit that bikies and stuff like that do. Like, uh, I'm not saying you're involved in bikies, but you know, it's, it's a heavy thing. I don't know. Look, I, I know that everyone's always just saying that, they're, they're, I don't know, I don't want to play into the image of bravery, but it's it's just another thing that I've had ever since I was a kid. I don't really, I'm not really perturbed by you filthy though? Threats or... You're filthy? You want to know who the fuck did it? Like, do you, do you, do you get obsessed? No. I want to find out who did that. No. You know what is really weird about that? That's something else. I don't care at all who firebombed my house. I have no interest in that. I have no ill will towards them. But I fucking hate journalists. You know, like, it's really weird. It's just like, they'll get under my skin. A journalist saying something, any lie at all, I'll obsess over it for months. But someone firebombing my house, I'm just like, oh, well, that's clearly a message. I wonder what it was. Well, that's what I'm asking because, like, <laughs> I mean, I saw you hook into Paul Barry pretty hard because he, you know, he was uh, accusing you of doing things that he does every day of the week. Um, <laughs> you know, we go and ask Kerry Packer what he thinks about – well, Kerry's dead now – but ask Kerry Packer what he thought about it at the time when Paul Barry released that book on him. Mm. Um, your – and it takes you right back to the beginning – your – Ability to efficiently say what you thought, but at the same time give it as much edge as possible was I thought it was unbelievable. Um, like it was so fucking good, it was ridiculous. Um, and <laughs> I, I'm not I'm not a big Paul Barry fan myself, <laughs> and uh, but, but you know, only because like I just think he's unfair, and I don't mind someone being the way they are if they own up to it. I don't give a shit. Yes, you say what you think. Yes. You own it too because you believe in it. Yeah. And that's cool. Yes. But don't double standard someone. I fucking hate that. Isn't that so? Th that sense of moral superiority Fuck off. is the, exactly. I mean, dude, like, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm, he's, I'm probably not his, he's probably not my biggest fan either, but. I don't I don't understand like why the fuck do you just keep pulling everyone's pants down, but someone someone pulls your pants down, you get the shits. And then you just put a highlight reel up on about them. And you just take him to town. I don't understand that shit. Like I don't get it. Neither um, do I. I really don't understand it. Play I, properly. Yes, that's the way to put it. Play properly. I get it. Why isn't that? Like I really don't understand. Like the need behind these people to kind of give themselves this arbiter of I'm fair and balanced and better than everyone. I don't know why they need to keep that facade up. Well, can I now just say something which probably I hopefully I don't piss off the people who listen to my show, but. I said it before, people, older people, over 50 for argument's sake, look at your cohort of people and the people you talk to as, oh, you fucking think you're entitled to do this, that and the other, and you do whatever you fucking want. You have a sense of entitlement. I'm of the view, people in my category, over 50, we think we're more entitled than everybody. And I actually think that the audience that Paul Barry talks to, and to a larger extent even the ABC generally, but we are 
they talk to an entitled audience who also reflect on the and the person who's doing the talking, the journalist, also thinks he or she's entitled. They don't like you. You're an upstart and you don't have enough runs on the road or, or runs on, runs in the game and you haven't put enough le- uh, rubber on the road, I should say, to have an opinion just yet or de- definitely not to have millions of people following you. Mm. How dare mm. you mm. have a view on these things? Mm. The underestimation of someone like you, your accumulated knowledge. In other words, Paul Barry's probably never sat down and talked to you and realised that you are a student of everything you say, mm. that you actually read book after book after book and study things and walk through libraries and blah, blah, blah. You understand all the stuff he probably understands too. There's no reason why Jordan can't condense into 30 years or say his last 15 years, what Paul Barry condensed into his last 40 years. Mm. There's no reason. Mm. That is an underestimation of, let's call it the enemy. Mm. You should never underestimate, underestimate the enemy. And mm. Never. Mm. Never. And I think that's a fatal mistake that us older people make. We mm. underestimate younger people. I'm mm. like our four kids, four boys, all in your mm. age category. Mm. Smart kids. And they never stop surprising me about what they fucking know at their age relative to what I knew at their age. It's nothing to do with me because me being their father. But like you, they consume shit and they they dive into things head first and they just eat it up. We should never underestimate that. In fact, what we should do is you should be sitting back and actually encouraging these points of view. You know, but I might not agree with you or them, my kids, but I still like to hear what they've got to say. Just like I like sitting here listening to what you've got to say because at the end of the day we all fucking learn something from everybody. Mm. I don't give a shit what the conversation is, who it's with, mm. which is why I do the show. Mm. I learn something mm. every single time about how to think mm. 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 and remaining curious. Mm. Older people lose their curiosity. Right, right. There's definitely an element of that, isn't there? You are sure. curious. Yeah. About every fucking thing. Yeah. Everything in your wheelhouse. Yeah. And you, opposed to me, when I was your age, you got access to finding out all that shit out. Yeah. Then what you wanted to do was prosecute it. Mm. What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. Mm. I, I, we need more energy in this country, more energy. Mm. Mm. Proper directed energy from people like you. We need more of it, which is probably the reason why you got such a following. They're getting your energy. Yeah, I mean, look, it's not very, it's, it's not very hard, is it? It's, well, I mean, when you look at like American political commentators, there's a few that have some theatrics to them, and they have some polemics. But when it comes to the Australian talent scout, I mean, the fact that Paul Barry's a top dog, he's basically an animatronic puppet. He, he's, he's no, there's <laughs> barely any life there. <laughs> Yeah, the top. Paul, I hope you're listening to this. We'll send, it, we'll send that clip. We'll just shot it straight into him. But, but you could say that about lots of leaders in lots of categories around Australia too, by the way. I mean, you could say about the Reserve, no, there's Gov- actually, Reserve yeah, Governor. Yes. You could say the same thing. Yes. I mean, you're absolutely right about that about Australia. It is, it's it's that lucky country mentality. Yeah. It really is. There's not much energy well, here. But people camp fight. in like the position. Like you're Greek, aren't you? Greek? Yeah, yeah my mum's Irish, dad's Greek, yeah. Yeah. But they, they, that's that's a fiery country. Oh, always, man. The Irish, especially, they're always fucking protesting about something. They like they love a protest, and yeah, the Greeks yeah. too. Like uh, it's funny. One of my sons is there at the moment. He said he texted me yesterday. He said, "Dad, I'm in Athens," and he said, "Dad, every afternoon at two o'clock, there's a march, and everybody pulls down all their shutters and all the thing, and there's a march every day. <laughs> they're marching about something different. <laughs> there's thousands of them coming down the streets. <laughs> he says, killing me. So two o'clock, and, they, and then about four o'clock, because." Two o'clock siesta time, they're all going to have a, have a wine and a bit of lunch and have a sleep, all the shop owners. And then at four o'clock, the march is over and everybody goes back to work and they put the shows back and back to business, back to normal. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So that's their siesta, yeah, that's a, a protest. A, a protest. Where? So, but, but I like conflict. I like seeing conflict. I like seeing different ideas. Mm-hmm. Maybe it is because of my background. Perhaps it is. Because I always saw people with opinions. Mum always had strong opinions. Of course. Always strong yes. fucking opinions, and uh, and we're very opinionated people, Irish uh, and Greek. Oh, for, totally. Yes, and actually, but it was good. It dra- I got dragged into it. Exactly. You know, and I had to learn to be part of it. Do you think in Australia that we are scared of opinions? 
I don't think it's so much this thing of scared of opinions. I think it's just a very apathetic, lazy country because it never really had to fight for much. I think that's the difference. It's like, you know, Greece was fighting over an area the size of a tennis court for, what, 2,000 years? Yeah. You know, like this. And the Irish are the same. <laughs> that, been, that makes you argue about ideas a lot. Huh? And, the, and the Irish are the same. They've been, they've yes. been defending against English for whatever. Yes. And, and that's quite an interesting point. So... I think it's just that we're a very resource-rich, large country with very few people on it. It's really you don't really have to try that hard to keep your head above. So water how do we here. change that? How do we get people to be more I aware? I don't think you can. I think that's just an environmental thing. I think that the general default tone of this continent will always be apathy. It doesn't have the same conflict that Europe had. So how do you how do, how do you succeed in your mission? How do you measure that? I don't really think, because I think that that's the case. With this country, there's a lot of things to be extreme. As everyone says, I mean, you know it's a platitude, but really, how often do you fly to some other country and then when you come back to Australia, you're just like, thank God I've got this passport. It, it, there's like maybe two countries I've ever been to where I thought, yeah, I could live there. Yeah. Everywhere else, I'm yeah. just like, thank fuck. Yeah, yeah, 100%. <laughs> uh, no, no, you're right. You're, you're coming over the, over, over the, at, at Botany there and you're like, fuck, I'm glad to be dropping the landing back here. Yeah. This is good, such a good joint. Yeah. But before I go, I think I've got to get the fuck out of here um, equally. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, there's the, the you know, wanting to stretch because, your wings. Yeah. But, no, but it doesn't, no, but sometimes, no, but sometimes it kills me here. Like sometimes the abject failure of everything, like the whole system, just fucks me up. Like, I mean, I've been thinking to myself a lot lately. What I've really noticed is you've opened up more, you've, your body language is changing. Wish the camera was on it. He's actually, <laughs> he's now, he's, he's, we're now chatting, but well, at least I'm chatting anyway. But um, I've been thinking for some time, it's nearly like we need a new party, like uh, somewhere that adopts the best parts of the Liberal Coalition, some get, adopts the best part of the, the the Labor Party and maybe there's one or two elements of the, the Greens you could drag into it, nothing out of the Palmer Party. Um, so but what do you think about that conceptually, like in a political sense? Do you think there's a, a middle ground? I mean, I, I know they're all occupying the middle of the ground at the moment, but do you think there's an actual middle ground party that – could evolve in politics in Australia because well, they're too polarised. Man, my argument would be that the Labor Party is the middle party. Like I, they I have think moved that there's in the this of the idea of there's always this elusive idea that there's going to be some. I think this is just a thing of the human psychology, isn't it? That there's there's some saviour force out there that one day is going to just ascend from the heavens. You remember this? Yeah. Do you remember this phrase? I can't remember who said it, but like, uh, no one's coming to rescue you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, like yeah. that is such a liberating thought yeah. to have. I think that it's just when when it comes to this idea that there's this other party, they, they come and they go. There's the Australian Democrats. Before that, there was the Democratic Labor Party. Now there's the Greens. There's always this third, you know, saviour party that's coming. It's always a con. It's like that's pretty – look, I know that people have their qualms with Karl Marx, but I do think that he actually did identify some very basic principles of how society runs in that really there's two conflicting forces in every society ever, and that is capital versus labour. And I think that the Labour Party has always been this thing of, no, we should be representing the workers, but they also understand that the business owners need to make a profit as well and they understand that that's how you move the country forward. When you bring those two forces together, I mean, look, the golden age of the Labor Party that everyone always goes back to, the Hawke-Keating years, those were the most economically prosperous years in Australian history. When it comes to Kevin Rudd, no one wants to admit it, he got us out of the global financial crisis. No one else did. They always just try and point to China. Well, China was buying resources from every other country on earth. Why didn't they fall into it? It was because of strong economic management. It's because these are people, like you, you met Bob Carr, right? Like that's a, that's a brain. Mm. That is a very intelligent man. You can't say that that man doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, like it, it always attracts those people because it's a party of pragmatism. It's a party of what works. They're interested in what works. Like that, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm more and more interested in the more I go into politics these days. I'm not interested in like ideals or like this, this, po this policy would solve lives. And can you implement it? Has it been implemented somewhere else? What were the problems with it? What happens when you implement it? Oh, it's not working. Okay, we'll stop it. You know, like I, th I think that's it. It's just the if it's not broken, don't fix it mentality. Mixed with, if it is broken, fix it. 
My two favourite periods of politics, you just hit on it, was more about the characters as well. So Hawke Keating to me was one of the best periods, polit- political periods in, yeah. in Let my Let me memory. ask you something about that. When it was happening, did you think it was or were you saying, oh, this No, in hindsight because when it was happening I was much younger and inflation got a bit out of control and yes. in the early 90s as a result of the as a result of the exuberance the economy started to experience in the late 80s in the early 90s I had to sell my house because I couldn't afford to pay interest rate anymore because yeah. I was fucked so my memory at the time was I wasn't happy with labor I wasn't happy with poor to be honest with you mm-hmm. um but then the Howard, I, I, but equally, I think the Howard period was very good too. I think mm-hmm. John Howard was a good politician. Mm-hmm. But when I look at the politicians post Howard, I don't think there's anyone who matches Hawke, Keating, Howard. Um, at the time, Crean, Frank, Frank and Simon Crean back in the Labor Party days. Um, I, I don't really have much memory prior to that. I don't have much memory prior to the, the 80s, mid 80s when the Labor Party came in. But I just think there was a lot of good policy and in hindsight a lot of good policy but great intellect, that's what I felt I, yes. today. I think there was great intellect mm-hmm. and but and also great commitment. Mm-hmm. I mean Keating today, all right, he's a, he sort of gets a bit up everybody but at the same time he's still prepared to get up everybody mm-hmm. and he still has great intellect. Yes. Howard is not as old as – is older than Paul um, – but Howard still has good intellect. I mean, mm-hmm. and they're prepared to say what they bloody believe in. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Step up, mm-hmm. and they live by their beliefs. By the way, that's not bullshit. I think they live by it. So I would say, to me, that they were the some of the greatest periods. I'm sure the greatest periods prior to that, but that I've ever experienced. Today, I don't feel as though I get the same characters. I mean, I'm prepared to give Albanese and Jim Chalmers and those guys a go because they've only been five minutes. So I don't know the answer to that question, but. That's something that I think they should aspire to. Well, again, it's it's the beast of the media machine. I really do think that. I, do, I think that like when it comes to all of these politicians, they are still very intelligent people, but there's two elements that are happening there. The first one being that now if you want to become a politician, really you have to start in university and you just have to go down that path your entire life. So you become very, very trained in the art of sound bites you become very trained in the art of if i say this this faction will get pissed off at me that that's how you move down that path because it's become a very professionalized industry there's definitely that i mean look that was what keating did but he was kind of the the godfather of all of it i suppose um there's there is that but it's also yeah like i i frequently go back and watch paul keating and bob hawk being interviewed by people and you can tell you can tell that there was that great intellect behind what they were saying but i think it's because the press allowed them to say it now they're kind of just with these gotcha questions remember that like how they tried to sink albanese in the last election because he couldn't remember yeah, yeah. i can't remember yeah. some no, no, it official, cash, official cash rate the cash rate yeah it was just like he's not ready to leave yeah, call, because call, he call, forgot call, something after campaigning for two but jordan months. paul would have remembered it Paul, oh, yeah, but yes, yeah, and, Paul and would have remembered. Straight but up. See, the thing is, the, we don't know that because the press wouldn't have been that unfair. They yeah. wouldn't have tried to get yeah. him on these, like, little, like, what, what's Paul. the capital of Iceland? Like, this kind of <laughs> shit, you know? Like, <laughs> Man, and you're right, there's a, there's a new medium. But when I look at what Paul Keating achieved, I mean, what he did for the union movement and in terms of industry funds, superannuation industry funds, is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. When you think. It's huge. That, it's massive. There and what he did for the Labor Party by mm-hmm. doing that for the unions mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and creating industry funds that now are equivalent to any bank in the country. In fact, if you're talking about something in terms of moving the country forward, that's pretty much the only thing that's holding us together these days, I think. I really do think that. I think that superannuation is really the only thing we see any innovation. Anytime I ever have a friend that wants to start some kind of entrepreneurial business idea, they immediately go to the super funds. Yeah. That's the first stop. And th- I think it's... Like no one's ever really ever given him the accolades he deserves for doing that. But that is like in terms of policy, my God, that is ridiculously Huge. massive, massive. Yes, yeah, so big. There's nobody who's done anything equivalent nah. in the last 40 years in my, my opinion. Nah. And I had lunch with Paul and he also was the very first person to remind me he came along and he bought a clipping of a paper that he kept from 1995 
which had his handwriting on it, it was photocopied, did me the actual paper, gave a photocopy. He said, my, he even went to my school and he said to me, we're having lunch down at uh, Bondi and he said, he just gave it to me let's straight up um, and had uh, that business you own, Wizard Business, which uh, allowed you to compete with the banks. He said, that's as a result of what I did, uh, how I reformed the banking system and made it able to, made non-banks able to come into the marketplace. And to prove it, I have the clipping of the newspaper with my handwriting on it in night from 1995, Fin Review, front page. The guy's a beast, intellectual beast. You know what's so weird? I was thinking exactly that when I was driving here. I was just like, your wealth is a result of those reforms. Yeah, yeah, so the it reforms. Just clicked in my head when yeah, I was It came out of the Campbell here. Inquiry, so which he, they, they yeah. introduced in the late 80s, and yeah. they the Campbell Inquiry recommended, you know, uh, wholesale changes to the banking system yes. to allow stop the banks having so much power. Yes. But by the way, the whole trade union movement and the industry funds was stop the banks from having so much power mm-hmm. again. Mm-hmm. And uh, well, I don't know if you recall this, but when they called the Royal Commission, the Hain Royal Commission more recently, um, the Liberal Party included the Royal Commission to inquire into the trade, uh, the uh, industry funds as well, just to sort of give them a bit of a clip. Didn't work, nothing happened. Um, but, and it's obviously a big deal in the Liberal Party's mind that Paul, the Labor Party through Paul Kenny had introduced all this stuff back in the 90s. That's, it's actually nation building stuff that yes. they did. Yes, This is Huge. That's what I mean by policy, nation building, stuff that builds a nation. Yeah. To me. Yeah. And uh, and yeah. it doesn't matter which way I vote. I will call it the way it is. What Keating did, and our Hawke brought Australia together. By the way, yeah, he was just a brilliant leader. Mm-hmm. But what Keating did at an intellectual level, nobody's repeated that. No, and is you it? never will. Like there's only one Paul Keating. But, that's that's well, but, you know, we shouldn't let Paul know you that. You can't put everyone at the pedestal of like we can't let you're Paul not know Usain that, Bolt, you know. Like, well, <laughs> well, we, but, well, and he was a Usain Bolt in terms of politics, I think, intellectually. In ter- I think world class. Honestly, it was really weird if he was. In America, he'd be the president of the United States. Sure. If he was in the EU, he'd be the pre- whatever they have of the EU. He'd be there. He'd yeah, be top. at the absolute top of it, and he'd probably actually be more appreciated than he was here. Yeah, and uh, and, and and we're lucky. I mean, I'm, I'm I feel as though I'm lucky to have met him, but I feel I feel as though I'm lucky to I lived through a period where he existed. But at the time, I was filthy on him because they they put interest rates up to seven or eight percent, and they just knocked me out of the property market, put me on the rental market, and I had three, four kids at the time. Um, it was a tough period. But nonetheless, when I look back on it to answer your question, looking back, at the time I didn't enjoy that part, but looking back, it's brilliant. But anyway, I'm, I've been wound up a hundred times by my producer over here. And, but Sorry. This, uh, this has been so good. I really enjoyed myself, Jordan. I know we didn't talk much about your uh, your YouTube series, um, but you, are, don't, you, don't, you, you don't, don't need my to. help, mate. You're killing it anyway. No, no, no. I've enjoyed the, the conversation a hell of a yeah. lot. Really no, nice. and I really enjoyed meeting you. Thanks very much, Jordan. Thank you.